Good morning. Great to see you. Great to see everyone with us this morning. So I was asking about announcements and somebody on our boot boy said it's a beautiful day and that's uh, definitely true. Uh, we do have a few announcements this morning. It's good to see a couple people back with us today. Good to see Tony with us today. He seems to be doing pretty good. It's also good to see Chris Keller with us. He's got, got the day off. He would, he'd be here if he wasn't working all the time. Good to see him here with us today. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, Jake Wicker, uh, the Davis' son, all has COVID and has uh, come in contact with several of the, the families. So there, Russ is able to be here with us. He's the only one that hasn't been in contact with us. Uh, Bill Lambert is in uh, room 308. Uh, be sure to keep him in your prayers. Maria Anderson is uh, Maria Anderson's mom. Sorry, Maria Anderson's mom is at home doing better. So. Keep her in our prayers as well. Dot Little is at home following her colon surgery. <clears throat> see, Lucille Mullins is having a pacemaker put in. So let's be sure to keep all these people in our prayers. Anybody that I missed or overlooked or didn't ask, if not, well, it's always great to have Brian here with us and he'll be leading our singing today. Good morning. Glad to have everyone with us today. Do things a little bit differently for our first song. If you can stand with me, we will sing I Stand Amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Of the nations and great and the 
Father and God, we come before you this morning through Jesus, our mediator, approaching you from humbly, asking you to hear our prayer. We're so thankful for Jesus. It makes all things possible. It makes it possible for us to, to approach you in prayer. And we're thankful for Jesus who lived and who died and who experiences what we experience and, and can mediate for us. We're so thankful for, <clears throat> for he makes possible the forgiveness of sins. He makes possible the plan of salvation. He established the church. We're so thankful for the church, Father. We're thankful for Corinth. We're thankful for every person that meets here. For every person that's a member of this congregation. We just pray, Father, that you would bless us with growth. We're so thankful for the church worldwide. We're thankful for the missionaries who are serving in hard fields. And we pray for those that we have a small part in helping, and we pray, Father, that your mission will be acceptable. We realize, Father, that we are a weak and sinful creatures, and we do and say things that we know we shouldn't say and do, and we leave undone many things that we should do. And through Jesus' blood and your grace and mercy, Father, we ask you for forgiveness of our sins. We're thankful for your word. We're so thankful that we have it to guide our lives by. We're so thankful, Alan, who brings it, our, your word to us on a regular basis. Bless him, Father, with a long and useful life. We're so thankful for your word, and we just pray, Father, that as we study it, that we can apply it and be the kind of people that you'd have us to be. We pray for the number of our members who are sick. We're thankful for answered prayers, Father. We're thankful that Tony is back with us this morning. Certainly that was an answered prayer. We pray for Bill Lambert. We pray, that, Father, that you will bless him with healing. Pray for Dot Little. We're thankful for her operation of success and she'll be back with us soon. We pray for Maria's mother. We're thankful that she's home, Father, and you will bless her and bless Maria as she takes care of her. We pray for all those on our prayer list. We pray that you will bless them on someone you can. Father, we pray for our country. We pray for our leaders. We just pray, Father, that you will send us leaders that will lead this country back to you. They will look to you for the guidance, for wisdom, and the decisions they make. And once again, this country be united and known as a God-fearing country. We just pray, Father, that there's a lot of good people in this country, and we pray that you will have them stand up and, and for what is right. And once again, we can be united as one God-fearing country. We're thankful for the promises you've made us. We're thankful for the hope that we have. We just pray that you would increase our faith in it, so in your promises and your hope. We just pray that everything we do and say today will be in accordance with your will, that your name will be glorified, and we will be, <clears throat> we'll be blessed for being here. Go with us through this service, Father, and through this life, and Pray that we live our lives so that when our time here is over, that you will take us home to that place you have prepared for us. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Next song is going to be His Name is Wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Yeah. 
From Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. In these verses, there are several things that I think we should never forget. And the first thing that we should never forget is the cruelty that our Lord experienced going through the process of redeeming you and me. Uh, the first thing that we need to remember is the cruelty of the crown. Back in verses 27 through 31, we read this about the crown. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put on a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off of him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. The crown of thorns is a symbol of a rejected sovereign. In John 19, verse 15, we read this. Away with him, they cried. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. What a horrific statement for God's chosen people. What a horrific statement for the spiritual leaders of God's chosen people. We have no king but Caesar. That statement not only rejects Jesus as the Messiah, but God, Yahweh, as their king. The king of eternity came to this world that he made, and he was rejected by the very people made in his image. They refused to allow him to rule over him. We also have the cruel crowd. Again, just prior to our text for the morning, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Just as the crown of thorns was a symbol of the rejected sovereign, the cruel crown is a symbol of the rejected servant. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1, verse 11. We also see the cruel cross. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves and casting lots, sitting down, began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The cruel cross is a symbol of a rejected Savior. We read throughout the Word of God the sufferings of the cross. For example, in Psalm 22, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of the dead. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. 
From Isaiah 53, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and His scourgings, or by His scourgings, we are healed. In Psalm 129, the plowers plowed upon my back. They lengthened their furrows. From Isaiah 50, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. I did not cover my face from their humiliation and their spitting. And finally, from Isaiah 52, just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Yes, we must never forget the cruelty that our Lord went through paying the price for our sins. But we must also never forget the cries. We see as Jesus hung on the cross seven different statements. The first one was a forgiving cry from Luke 23, verse 34. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. I find it interesting that Jesus ends His ministry in the exact same way that He began His ministry, with prayer. What He could have done was call down 10,000 angels. We sometimes sing that song. But instead, He exercised grace. He could have shouted condemnation, but He shouted forgiveness. And so not only was it a forgiving cry, but it was a favoring cry. He said to the repentant thief on the cross, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Even as he was dying, Jesus demonstrated in real time and in real form why he came to this world. He came to this world not to condemn, but to save. He extended grace to one who was totally unworthy of that grace. Ephesians 2 verse 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that any man should boast. He had a forgiving cry. He had a favoring cry. He also had a family cry. From John 19, verse 25, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were His mother and His mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw His mother and the disciple whom He loved standing nearby, He said to His mother, Woman, behold your son. Then He said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Jesus took the time to provide for His mother. <clears throat> she had no one, so Jesus gave her someone. Even as He hung on the cross, paying the spiritual price and the physical price for our sins, Jesus' thoughts were not selfish. They were selfless. Even though He understood He had a bigger spiritual agenda, He was still nonetheless concerned with the human reality of His condition. It was a forsaken cry. Matthew 27, verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a verse that aggravates me, not because of the verse, but because of what we try to do to this verse. Uh, there, there are those who will try to explain Scripture away. And I don't understand why we want to try and explain away Scripture. I understand when we try to explain away Scripture sometimes. Uh, we explain away Scripture because we don't like what Scripture says. We don't like what it calls us to. And so we want to explain it away so we can do whatever we want to do. Uh, I understand when we're doing that. I don't understand how we try to explain this one away. And the way we try to explain this one away was, well... God didn't really forsake the Son. God didn't really forsake the Son. Jesus is just speaking about how His emotional feelings are. His emotional state. He feels like He has been forsaken. And, and I have a couple of problems with that. Problem number one is, that's not what the Word of God says. Uh, 
and that's a fundamental problem for me. But beyond that, I think that one of the reasons that we might try to explain this away is because if we actually think about it for a few minutes, it can become overwhelming. And, and I think it should be overwhelming, to be perfectly honest. I think it should overwhelm us, the reality of what happened on the cross. When Jesus became sin on that cross, yes, I believe He was forsaken by God. I think Habakkuk 1 verse 13 helps us understand that. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You cannot look on the wickedness with favor. And so Jesus took the sin of the world on Himself on the cross. For the first time in all eternity, there was a break in fellowship between the Father and the Son. Jesus was judged as sin on the cross. Jesus was judged guilty on that cross for your sins and mine. John 3 verse 36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Why is it that the one who has not believed has the wrath of God on him? Because he has not believed and has not allowed the blood of Jesus to deal with his or her sin, with his or her wickedness. Now, why is it that those who have allowed the blood of Jesus to deal with their sins, why is it that the wrath of God does not abide on them? It is because the wrath of God abided on Jesus on that cross. He was forsaken. The Word of God says it, and the power of our salvation is made stronger by accepting the truth that the Son was in fact forsaken on the cross. We probably don't want to think about that because it's a little too uncomfortable for us to think about it. I would suggest we need to get comfortable with the discomfort of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It was, yes, a forsaken cry. We also see a fervent cry from John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill Scripture, said... I am thirsty. Here's another one that we like to explain away. And again, it just it aggravates me. Why can we not just accept what the Word of God says? Uh, there are those who suggest that God the Son did not actually die on the cross. That as Jesus the human was being nailed to the cross, the Spirit or soul or whatever left and it was only the physical human body that died on the cross. Uh, and again, I'm not exactly sure why we want to explain this one away other than the idea is too uncomfortable for us that God the Son actually died on the cross. Uh, but again, I think you're taking something away from salvation if you don't allow it to be exactly what it is. And, and so the argument is that this cry that I, I am thirsty is just coming from a, a human being, flesh and blood, not from deity, not from God the Son. Uh, you've really got to do a lot of mental gymnastics to make that make sense in any way possible. And again, I think you take something away from salvation if you do that. Because the statement, I am thirsty, underscores, emphasizes His humanity. As the Hebrew writer said, we do not have a high priest that cannot sympathize with our weakness. Why? Because He was tempted and tested and tried in all manner such as we, yet without sin. Yet without sin is why He is the perfect Lamb of God that can take away the sins of the world. See, it all works really well together when you accept the Word of God at face value. But what we see here is, yes, that humanity. We can have confidence that Jesus understands. We sometimes sing that song too. My Jesus knows when I am lonely. Listen, everything you have gone through in life, everything you will go through in your life, Jesus went through in His life. All the way down to being thirsty. It kind of makes me wish I'd have brought my water bottle up here with me this morning. 
Jesus on the cross was deity, yes, and he was humanity. The one who made all the water suffered thirst for you. He died without physical water on the cross so that you and I would be able to drink spiritual water. John 4:14. 4, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The very end of the Bible, Revelation 22, we read this. The Spirit and the Bride says, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. And yet, even though Jesus said, I am thirsty, and I am confident that that speaks of physical thirst, His thirst wasn't merely physical. Remember, God the Father turned His back on the Son by necessity. The entire world grieved and groaned because of it. Darkness, earthquakes, remember? The entire creation grieved and groaned the forsakenness of the Son. But Jesus' thirst wasn't just physical. Psalm 42, verse 1, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs after Thee. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Again, let us think about this separation. Throughout all history, throughout all time, actually, no, that's not right. Throughout all eternity, the Father and the Son have been united. On the cross, that fellowship is broken. Now, let's contextualize what was going on on the cross in terms of that separation, in terms of our lives as well. Because we do not like separation, do we? We do not like separation at all. Parents, children, do you remember dropping your kid off at college? when they went to a university out of town or out of state, I'm willing to bet money there were some tears that were shed. Uh, when, when your children get married and, and they are living in their own house, or when one of their jobs takes them to another city, to another state, there were tears that were shed. And, and that is temporary. They're coming home for summer. More and more, they're not only moving back to the town that they grew up in, they're moving back into mom and dad's house. We can call them, we can FaceTime them. There are all kinds of things that we can do to keep in touch and to keep in contact. And yet the idea of temporary separation overwhelms us sometimes with, with sadness. Now think of a God throughout all eternity has not experienced this separation. It was a forsaken cry. It was a fervent cry. And He was forsaken by His Father. Jesus was forsaken by His Father so that we could call Him Father. Ephesians 1 verse 6, To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Because Jesus was forsaken by His God, by His Father. You and I are now adopted sons and daughters. We are the beloved. It was a finishing cry. John 19, verse 30, It is finished. It was brought to a close. It was brought to an end. It was brought to a finish. What was finished? Well, I suppose there are several things that we could say were finished. Number one, his suffering was finished. Number two, Satan was finished. Oh, I understand he's still alive, but he's a dead man walking. I've read the book of Revelation. Yes, he's alive, but the death blow was placed upon him at the cross. The old sacrificial system of the Old Testament sends power all were finished with this one word. 
And no, that wasn't a Joe Biden gaffe. In Greek, it's one word. In English, we say it is finished. To less the time is what Jesus said. To less the time, it is finished. I find it interesting that Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Because 72 hours later, a remarkable event is going to occur. I don't know if this was on Jesus' mind or not when He said, it is finished. But I hear in that statement, I am a victor, not a victim. I am a victor, not a victim. And you and I, as the children of God, are not victims. We are victors as well. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Heaven's greatest treasure, Jesus, had been withdrawn and sent to earth to spend Himself for lost sinners. He did it fully, and upon completing that, history's greatest redemptive transaction was completed. And now he has redeposited himself and more valuable than ever back into heaven's bank and the Father's hand. Notice that Jesus said, I lay my life down. In the old King James Version, after we read it is finished, it says, He gave up the ghost. More modern translations say, gave up His spirit. I find that very, very interesting. The Romans didn't kill Him. He laid down His life. And at the right time, He gave up His spirit. No man killed Him. He laid His life down willingly. So let us never forget the cross. I hope that we would never forget the cause. Having understood what Jesus endured on the cross, let's take a moment and discuss the cause for it. First of all, the cause was our condition. Everyone in this world deserves help. Even as redeemed Christians, that is still what we deserve. Remember Ephesians 2 verse 8, we are saved by grace through faith, not of works lest anyone should boast. The wages of sin is death, Paul would say in Romans 6 verse 23. We are already judged and doomed, John 3 verse 18. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus came to deliver us from that condition. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. Luke 19, verse 10. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, verse 45. Paul said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So what's the cause? Our condition. But it was also His compassion. Without His compassion, without His love, our condition would have made no difference to Him. His mission can be summed up in one word. Love. He did what He did because He loves you. Revelation 1 verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to Him who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood. What's the other cause? His compassion. Because He loves us and He released us from our sins. How? By His blood. The cross. Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 1 John 3, 16. We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we conclude this morning 
not leaving Jesus on the cross, and certainly not leaving him in the grave. And so I hope that we would never forget the resurrection. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Matthew 28, verse 6. He is not here, he is risen. Seven words. Seven words that have completely altered the trajectory of the world. Now, the entire verse says this He is not here, he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. Love the word was, past tense. He is not here. He is risen. His word, just as he said. This wasn't something that wasn't planned. This wasn't something that was accidental. He is not here. He is risen. Why is that important? Because he said so. And then his return. Come and see the place where he was lying. He is no longer there. In Acts 1 verse 9 we read this, And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking at the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. See where he was lying, but he's not there anymore. He is going to return. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with Him in the clouds. The same manner that you saw Him ascend, you will see Him descend. And we will be caught up together with Him in the clouds. This weekend is Memorial Day weekend. As Carter prayed in his Thanksgiving prayer, we need to remember and be thankful for those who have not just sacrificed, but paid the ultimate price for our freedom. And as the church, may we never forget what Jesus did on the cross for us. Now, the title of the lesson today was May We Never Forget. Fact is, we never will. Fact is, we never will. If you go to heaven, then His presence will remind you. Revelation 5, verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. We will be in the presence of God. We will be in the presence of His Son. And His presence will always remind us of what He did. But if you go to hell, regret will haunt you for all eternity. Luke 16, verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. Regardless of what you do with Jesus today, you will never forget what He did for you on the cross. But more important, don't forget that it only takes 72 hours to change the world. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to Myself. Have you been drawn to Jesus? Have you allowed His blood to deal with your sin? If not, I would encourage you to make that decision this morning. Repent of sin, confess Jesus as the Christ, and have your sins washed away through baptism. And if, as a Christian, there is something in your life that you would like for us to pray with you and for you about, maybe there are some things that you have forgotten that you need to remember, 
But whatever the situation is, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, Jesus invites you. And we stand and sing to encourage you. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed.